Welcome everybody to this afternoon's session here on Forum Stage number one. I'm so glad that the room is so full and that I'm barely seeing people without headphones. For those of you who are still not wearing them, now is a great time to wear them. Channel two is this stage. Also, don't forget Slido. You will want to ask our next speaker a few questions, I can assure you that, because he is the first registered cyborg in the world. Now, what makes a cyborg, you might ask? Well, in the case of Neil Harbison, you might start with the antenna that has been implanted in his skull, giving him the capability to hear colors, hundreds of them. So he describes his own life experience as becoming technology. And today he will be talking about nothing less than just, you know, the renaissance of our species. So. Get ready, ask your questions, and please give a round of applause to the founder of the Cyborg Foundation. Please welcome to the Me Convention, Neil Harbison. Well, I was born with an unusual visual condition called achromatism, which means that I see things in grayscale. I've never seen blue, I've never seen yellow, I've never seen a color. So when people said blue or yellow, I had no image in my head and it was impossible for me to imagine what color was, even if someone tried to describe it very carefully. So I tried to ignore the existence of color when I was a child, but I couldn't ignore the existence of color because you keep mentioning colors every single day. So I kept hearing names like uh, yellow pages or Bluetooth or Greenpeace or Red Cross or Orange or uh, Pink Panther, the green card. Uh, there's also James Brown is in his last name. So I kept hearing <laughs> color names every single day. There's also this huge country called Greenland. So I couldn't ignore the existence of color. Also, when you use color as a code, it can be a bit confusing. Hot water, cold water, sometimes it's only uh, color that describes what the, the water temperature will be like. Also, maps, this is fine. But if I go to Tokyo, I can get easily lost because some maps only use color codes. Also, when I was a child and I was learning the colors of flags, I had this situation. <laughs> so... Uh, Three countries share exactly the same flag in my world, so it was a bit confusing. Also, if someone would ask me, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes, and dressed in pink? I would have absolutely no idea. The only information I get here is that the man has hair, that he has eyes, and that he's not naked, basically. <laughs> so the reason why I wanted to sense color was not because of the beauty of color, but, but because of the social element of color. When I was studying music composition, I realized that there's been many theories relating color and sound. Newton created one centuries ago, so I was really interested in the relationship between color and sound. Both color and sound are frequencies. Sound is an audio frequency, color is a light frequency, so they have something in common. You could easily scale down light until it became audible. So that was the project we started in 2003 to create some kind of system that would allow me to hear the sound of color. We started in 2003, it was basically a webcam connected to a five kilo computer and a pair of headphones. The software was slowing down the light frequencies until they became audible. So if we could hear the frequency of red, which is 420 millions of millions of waves per second, we would hear a note between F and F sharp. So that's the note that I heard, and that's how I started to identify colors through sound. So I memorized the names that you give to each color by the sound of it, and I was suddenly able to distinguish colors through this system that allowed me to hear the frequencies of the colors around me. I kept upgrading the software until I was able to sense 360 different microtones, one for each degree of the color wheel, and this is how I perceived color. So it's a uh, different sine waves. Um, I guess you're hearing it now. I'm not hearing it, so I guess it's different frequencies from F to F sharp here, so it's different. At the beginning it was a bit chaotic, there's electronic music everywhere all of a sudden because there's color everywhere, so wherever I looked I would hear noise and music, so my brain got used to it after five months, and then my brain got used to just sensing color through sound. I was able to distinguish all colors through different frequencies. Um, when I was able to sense all the visual spectrum, I, mean, I didn't see why I should stop there, because there's many more colors that exist that the human eye cannot sense, like infrareds and ultraviolets. So in 2007, I decided to extend my perception of color beyond the visual spectrum, and I included infrareds and ultraviolets. So since then, I can now sense more colors than the visual spectrum of a human. I can detect if there's infrared or ultraviolet in a space. Sensing infrared allows me to know if there's movement detectors in a room, and that allows me to tell if the alarms are on or off in a shop or in a bank, and in many cases they are off. So it's interesting to know this little aspect. Also, 
Ultraviolet allows me to tell me if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe. If I sense that a high level of ultraviolet, then I put some cream or I avoid the sun. So my aim is to continuously extend my color perception beyond the visual spectrum. I didn't want to use technology and I didn't want to wear technology. I wanted to become technology. I wanted to create a new body part in order to sense color because I thought that would be much more practical. So at the beginning, I thought of creating a third eye that would be implanted in the middle of my head, but then I thought this would limit my color perception to what I would have in front. So I thought I would look at nature and I would look at different body parts, and I thought that an antenna would be much better. It would be an antenna implant for a human that would then sense color independently from the other senses. So I didn't want to use my eyes or my ears to sense color. I wanted an independent body part to sense color. So I thought that an antenna would, would be the best way, and also having the input of color frequencies in my bone instead of using my ears. So I wanted the vibration inside the bone depending on the light frequency so that I would feel color and also creating a vibration in the bone would create an inner sound. So I designed this new antenna and then I went to the doctor and I said, I wanted an antenna implant uh, when it was all finished. And he said, sorry, uh, we don't do antenna implants here. If you want to have an antenna implanted, you'll have to convince a bioethical committee because this is a new surgery and all new surgeries need to go through bioethical committees. So I explained what the surgery would be like and then they said no. The bioethical, said, uh, the bioethical committee said it was not ethical to have an antenna implanted in a human for three main reasons. One, because it's not the recreation of a pre-existing body part. If it was an arm or a leg, they would find it ethical. Secondly, because it's not the recreation of a pre-existing sense. This includes infrareds and ultraviolet, so it goes beyond the human perception of a human. And the third reason was because they were extremely worried about the image the hospital would have if someone came out with an antenna sticking out of the head. So they said <laughs> no to the surgery. And then I tried to find someone willing to do the surgery anonymously, and then I found a doctor that said yes, so we did the surgery anyway. This is my head facing down. We had four uh, uh, implants. So one is for the chip that vibrates inside my head depending on the light frequencies detected by this color sensor. The second implant is, uh, well, the two other, second, the second and third implant is to hold the structure of the antenna, so it goes inside the bone and is also integrated. And the fourth implant is internet connection, so I can also receive colors not from the antenna, but from any other device that can send colors to my head. So then we close this, and it took two months for the antenna to merge with my bone. So this is now part of my skeleton, and I'm officially taller as well, because this is part of my body. So I had to get used to the new height, because it's not only getting used to the new sense, but also getting used, used to this new height. Um, the internet connection, I use it to receive calls from five different points. I have five people in the world that have permission to send colors to my head. It's five percent, was one in each continent. So uh, if there's a beautiful sunset in Australia, my friend from Melbourne can use his mobile phone to stream live images from his mobile phone to my head. So I could be here, but suddenly be receiving colors from a sunset in Australia. Also, if they start sending colors at night, then they can either wake me up if I'm asleep or they can color my dreams. If someone starts sending blue colors when I'm asleep, my dream might suddenly become blue or my dream might take me to the sea or to the sky. So in a way, my friends can actually influence my dreams or they can color my dreams. And I see this as the use of the internet as a sense, which I think we'll start seeing much more of this in the 2020s, how we not only use internet as a tool or a communication system, but also a system to share senses or to extend our existing senses. This is an MRI scan of my brain. Uh, I feel no difference between the software and the brain anymore. So I feel cyborg. Cyborg is the union between cybernetics and organisms. So I identify as a cyborg because I feel that I am technology. And that's what I tried to explain to the UK government in 2004 because I had a problem because there's a, I had to renew my passport in 2004, and they said there was something wrong with the, with the picture. They said that there's something electronic, uh, and you have to remove this because there's a, a norm that says electronic equipment is not allowed on passport photos. So uh, they said that I had to remove it, and this became a small battle with the UK passport office. I told them that I identified as a cyborg, that I felt that this was a body part, not a device, that I'm not wearing an antenna. I have an antenna in the same way that I'm not wearing a nose or I'm not wearing uh, ears. I have a nose and I have ears and I have an antenna. They replied, no, again. They said, please remove this antenna. So it became a battle. In the end, they, after insisting, they said yes, and they allowed me to appear this is in May 2004 with the first system. Then the picture was renewed when I had the antenna implanted. So this helps me travel, because uh, in airports they don't usually like technology, so uh, I have several problems 
at the airports usually. Now I'm actually in conversations with the Swedish government. All the materials I used to create the antenna are Swedish, so I'm telling them that I am Swedish, therefore I should be entitled to apply for Swedish citizenship because uh, I am biologically Swedish. So. So now in 2017, there's th these five points. I think there should be a sixth point that says, if you have a Swedish body part, you are also entitled to apply for Swedish citizenship. I guess each country should uh, decide how many years you need to have a body part. I guess if you've had a body part for 10 years, you should be entitled to apply for Swedish citizenship. So we see what happens. Uh, I see all this as cyborg art, the art of creating your own senses, the art of creating your own body parts, and the art of designing your own perception of reality. The issue with this art is that I am the artist, I am the audience of this art, because I'm the only one experiencing it, and I'm also the place where it's happening. So it's a bit uh, difficult to share this art, because I am the only one experiencing it. But then there's also ways of sharing this art, uh, creating it uh, by using the sense in different art uh, art means, uh, art, um, existing art forms. But this could also be seen as perceptionism, because the aim of this art is to create a specific perception of reality. Some of my daily things have changed. For example, before I would dress in a way that it would look good, now I can dress in a way that it sounds good. Depending on the notes that I wear, I can wear specific chords. Like this would be a C major combination, so I would be wearing this in a very happy occasion, because it's C, E, and G, C major. This is a minor chord, so I would dress like this in a sad occasion, like this in a funeral. I would come uh, with this combination because it's a minor chord. Or I can also wear a song. Depending on the designs that I wear, I can wear specific melodies. This is a tie that I designed that sounds like electronic music, so the longer the tie, the longer the melody. Also, food has changed a lot. I can now listen to food. So depending on how I put the food on the plate, I can actually eat a song. So I really enjoy composing music with salads. And we're also sharing this experience with uh, people from a restaurant in Celia de Can Roca in Barcelona, in the north of Barcelona. You can actually go there and uh, eat a specific song. So the food is placed on this uh, chroma phone. It's like a plate player where you rotate the plate and then you can actually hear the sound of the colors of the plate. So you can imagine in the future, you, you might be able to go to a sonochromatic restaurant where you can ask for some Mozart uh, dishes uh, or some uh, Lady Gaga dessert, and then you can actually eat different melodies. Imagine if you have children that don't like eating vegetables, maybe they would like eating vegetables if their salads sounded like Justin Bieber. So it might change the way we perceive uh, food if we have an extra layer of perception. This is now how I can compose music instead of playing an instrument. I can look at different objects and then create music in my head. And a way of sharing it is to amplify the sounds from my head to an audience. So these are color concerts. So I really enjoy walking around supermarkets because I find so many different notes and music in supermarkets, especially the aisles with cleaning products. That's the most exciting area of any supermarket because there's lots of different uh, melodies and very unexpected ones. Also, the way I sense art has changed. I can now listen to a Picasso. I can listen to an Andy Warhol. All painters have become composers, so it's changed the way I experience art and walking around the supermarket. I can literally hear the scream now, so it's uh, you can easily distinguish a painter by the sound of them. So Andy Warhol, for example, sounds very loud usually because it's very saturated, so you can hear an Andy Warhol from the other end of the museum usually because it's very loud. Whereas all the painters, you need to get a bit closer because they're less saturated. The way I sense people has also changed. When I look at someone, I can now hear their face. So I really enjoy getting close to the face and writing down the sound of the eyes, lips, skin, and hair. And then I send them an MP3 of their face so they can listen to their color combinations. One of the first ones I did was of Prince Charles. I asked him if I could listen to his face. And this was his reaction when I asked him. So we all have different sounds. Uh, Prince Charles sounds C major, for example, uh, whereas Judy Dench has silent hair. James Cameron has a very, very high sound pitch of skin. Al Gore has different notes in his eyes because different shades of turquoise. Tim Berners-Lee has a very unusual sound of eyelids. Moby sounds less than other people because he has no hair, so that's one note less. <laughs> Macaulay Culkin sounds like a pure chord, C major, pure. Uh, Steve Wozniak has a very uh, specific sound of eyes, it's A, pure A, uh, whereas Robert De Niro has very, very high sound pitch of lips, which is uh, unusual, and Woody Allen sounds very soft, like an unsaturated painting, 
uh, Philip Glass very microtonal, and Bono had very loud glasses here. So we all have a different sound combination. What really shocked me is that people who say they're black, they're not black, and people who say they're white, they're not white. People who say they're black, they're actually very, very, very dark orange, and people who say they're white, they're actually very, very, very light orange. So the fact that people say that humans are black and white is completely false. We are all different shades of orange. One of the exciting things of hearing faces is that I can also create face concerts where the audience cues and I amplify the sound of the lips, the hair, the skin, and I create rhythms based on the colors of the audience. So uh, electronic music is created from the frequencies of the faces of the audience. If the concert sounds really bad, it's their fault, not my fault, because that's where the music is coming from. And it's always different depending on the country it's, it's created. Uh, the last face concert I did was of Prince Albert II of Monaco, and he liked the sound of his face so much that he He's now using it as his ringtone. So whenever someone <laughs> calls him, he hears his face. So when we started uh, this project, uh, we didn't know if it would have secondary effects. The secondary effect is that I can now uh, feel color when I hear sounds or when I hear uh, music. So this is, for example, a painting based of, on what I hear. Uh, it's note by note, Mozart's Queen of the Night from the center till the end. So when I look at this painting, I can actually hear music now. Uh, this is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber, transposed into color, which looks very different from Mozart. Speeches can also be transposed into color, because when we talk, we use different frequencies that relate to different colors. And also, all this project has had a social reaction, because the antenna is visible. I've been stopped every single day in the street since 2004, since March 2004, and I've had the same type of reactions, but what people think it is has changed. In 2004, most people thought that this was a reading light, so they would ask <laughs> if I could turn on the light, or they would wonder where my book was. In 2006, they thought it was a microphone, like this one, so they thought I was in an internet cafe and I had the microphone on my head. In 2008, they thought it was a GoPro cam that I was filming my life, so many people would wave at me. In 2011, 12, people thought it was a hands-free telephone that I was on the phone. In 2013, people thought it was something to do with Google Glass. Uh, in 2015, children would ask if this was some kind of extendable selfie stick. Uh, and last year, people would just shout at me, Pokemon, and they tried to catch me. So it uh, keeps changing. It keeps changing what people think it is. Hopefully, in the 2020s, people will just think it's a new sensory organ or an antenna, and they will ask what sense this new sensory organ is giving me. I am pretty sure we'll be seeing more people with new organs and new senses in the street in the next decades, because now we have the possibility of merging with technology in order to have new organs and new senses, so we can literally deci decide what species we want to be, what organs and senses we want to be or have as a species. That's why we created the Cyborg Foundation in 2010 with Moon Rivas, who's also here, with the aim of helping people become cyborgs and also uh, promoting cyborg art and defending cyborg rights. Uh, we presented the uh, Cyborg Bill of Rights at South by Southwest back in February with Rich McKinnon. Uh, basic rights, the freedom to design yourself, which is now not, uh, uh, not uh, non-existent. This is an non-authorized surgery, because this is a transspecies surgery. It's the addition of senses and organs that are not traditionally human. This is now not permitted by bioethical committees, but we think we should all have the freedom to decide what senses and organs we want to have as a species. Some of the projects we did, we've done is, uh, this uh, example is internal rathers, senses that allow you to feel movement uh, with your eyes shut, you could, and depending on the interval of these uh, vibrations, you can then feel what speed an object or anything is moving in front of you, so you can develop a sense of perfect uh, speed. By turning around the earrings, you can actually feel if someone's behind you, so it's giving rearception or retroception. You can feel if there's presence behind you. This is very simple technology that can be created in, uh, and pierced in your body with just $25. Uh, we also created the seismic sense, which is implanted in Moon River's body. She can feel all the seismic activity of the Earth. Whenever there's an earthquake, she feels a vibration in her body. So uh, she has two heartbeats, basically. She has her own heartbeat and the Earth beat, because the Earth keeps uh, vibrating every 5 to 10 or 12 minutes. So she 
is now used to feeling all these constant vibrations and she calls this like a, her seismic sense. She also uses this artistically uh, in dance or in music. So if there's an earthquake, she moves in a dance performance. If there's no earthquakes during her dance performance, then there's no dance. Also, she uses this uh, in percussion. So she creates percussion based on the seismic, seismic activity of the planet. So it's a way of sharing this new sense to an audience. Since yesterday, Moon Rivas has now also connected to the moon. Uh, after meeting Buzz Aldrin, Moon and I went to the hotel and had surgery in the hotel room because we have uh, no other place to do it uh, other than places like this. She had uh, two new implants in her foot uh, that will allow her to connect to the seismic activity of the moon. She had this already uh, in her arms before, but it wasn't completely working. Now it will be working in her feet. So she has two sensors in her feet that will allow her to feel the seismic activity on the moon. So in the same way that in 1969, uh, Buzz Aldrin went to the moon and placed a seismograph on the moon. Uh, yesterday, we did the other way around. We placed the moon in moon's feet so that she can then feel the seismic activity of the moon in her feet. So it's a different way of exploring space. Instead of physically going to space, we can now sense our senses to space and become sense astronauts. This is a new way of exploring space, where I which I think in the 2020s we'll also see uh, much more of this happening. We can have exclusive senses in space, or we can extend our senses to space by using the internet as a sensory extension. In my case, my connection to the internet, I can use it to connect to NASA's International Space Station. So since 2013, I use this internet to connect to uh, the space station that then allows me to feel the colors from space. When I do this, my sense of color is no longer on Earth, but in the space. And this allows me to explore the colors that I don't get here, because in space, there's many more ultraviolets that I don't feel here. So it's a way of um, exploring space without having to physically go there. Some of the other projects we've done is that I have a tooth missing and I didn't want to have it replaced with a normal tooth. So in Brazil, uh, two years ago, we created a project to create the tooth light so that it's a small LED inside a tooth so that in case of total darkness, you can just click and then open your mouth and you have emergency light in your mouth. <laughs> This is something that many of you could do if you have a tooth missing. Many people don't like having implants, but tooth implants are quite common. So maybe this is the first step to having a new uh, sense or ability. In this case, it's bioluminescence. This is something that many species can do, create light in total darkness. I mean, in that, in that time, this is the light tooth, very small light that can be placed in any of your uh, spaces in the mouth. During that time, Moon also lost a tooth, so we thought, let's create some kind of system that allows us to communicate from tooth to tooth. So in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, we created this tooth that was placed inside my mouth, and then another tooth was placed inside Moon's mouth, and then basically whenever I click, she receives a vibration in her mouth, and whenever she clicks, I receive a vibration in my mouth. So we both know the Morse code, so depending on how we click, we can actually send words to each other. So we call this the transcendental communication system. And it was first demonstrated in Sao Paulo uh, last year. People in the audience were giving us words. And then we were sending the words to each other. And then we were saying them out loud. So it worked. It's a system that works from mouth to mouth. Basically, when you click, it goes to the mobile phone, from the mobile phone to the mobile phone of the other person, wherever she or he may be, and then from a mobile phone to the, to the tooth. So it's basically working through Bluetooth. So it's a Bluetooth tooth that allows you to communicate <laughs> from mouth to mouth. Some of the other projects we've done is fingerboards, different types of uh, implants in the tip of your finger that might allow you to extend your senses. One of the latest ones is that uh, a small vibration allows you to connect to a specific planet. So if you are very interested in Venus, your finger will vibrate whenever you, you point at Venus. Uh, if you're interested in Saturn or Jupiter, then you can have a finger connected to that planet. So now we have no idea where the planets are. We have no idea where we are in relation to the to the cosmos, so this little finger might allow you to have a connection with where we are in the cosmos. We also created uh, the sense of atmospheric pressure. This is placed now, uh, this is only 10 days old, so he's been wearing this exosense for 10 days. It allows you to feel the uh, pressure changes. So if the pressure, atmospheric pressure goes up, he feels a change in his ears. If it goes down, it goes down. So he can then predict if it's going to rain or not. He's a, literally a weatherman now, and he's getting used to this new sense of atmospheric pressure. This also allows him to know at what level he is from the sea. 
the latest project I am having for myself, and it's a new implant that I will have in the next months. It's a new organ that will be placed around my head. So I've always been interested in time, uh, but I've always been interested in the fact that we don't have an organ for the sense of time. We all have a sense of time, but we don't have an organ for the sense of time. There's no species with an organ for the sense of time. So I'm interested in seeing what would happen if we had an organ for the sense of time. So this is being designed now and 3D printed in New York. I call it the solar crown. It will be circular and it will give me a point of heat that will take 24 hours to go around my head. So depending on when I feel the heat, I will know where it's 12 o'clock solar time. So if I feel the heat here, I know it's 12 o'clock in London. This is Iceland. This is then going to the United States. So this will give me a sense of time. And it will automatically allow me to feel what time it is wherever I am. But the experiment for me is to see if my brain gets used to this organ, see if I can extend or, or make time feel a bit shorter depending on how I modify the speed of the point of heat. So if, a if I want the situation to last longer, I'll program the heat to go a bit slower. That this is in a few years when my brain gets used to the normal rotation of the Earth. And if I want time to go faster, I'll make it go a bit faster. So I want to see if we can actually control our perception of time if we have an organ for time. It's taking Albert Einstein's theory of time relativity into practice by creating an organ for the sense of time. If this works, then I'll be able to travel in time because time is a perception, not only something external, but also a perception. So if I want to travel in time, I might be able to spin it twice to feel that I'm traveling, or also I can uh, program it so I can also alter my age in a way. So if I want years to be a bit shorter, I could feel that I'm 150 years old when I'm actually just 68, or I could do uh, th things like this by modifying my perception of time. So it, this is an experiment that I'm starting this year. This is it. I think we are in a very interesting moment in time. We are probably the first generation that can truly design what sensors and organs we want to have as a species. So I encourage you to, to, to join these uh, experiments. You can use technology as a tool, or you can give sensors to machines, but you can also create sensors that become sensors and allow you to extend your perception of reality and explore nature and other species in a way that we haven't done before. I think becoming a cyborg connects you to nature and other species, not to machines. I don't feel closer to machines. I feel much closer to nature, because now I can sense infrared and ultraviolet that surround me in nature. I can also feel much more connected to other species, because I share a body part with them. Like I feel connected to insects now, because I share a body part with them. I also feel connected to animals that sense infrared. If I see my cat staring at a wall, and I sense there's infrared between the wall and the cat, I know that the cat is sensing at the infrared. So I feel that having new senses will allow us to connect to senses that other species have and also will allow us to feel nature and space in a deeper way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to join me over here? Have a seat. Thank you very much, Neil Harbison. Wow. So two things I've learned right off the bat. First of all, orange really is the new black. First, second of all, I now, <laughs> and now I understand the actual meaning of uh, word of mouth uh, communication, or as we say in German, hilariously, mouth to mouth, mund to mund. Oh, really? So there we go. You are actually living it. Before I jump into the audience questions, because I'm sure uh, Slido has been imploding with questions, um, you you said up there that you cannot feel the difference anymore between the software in your brain, the software in your body, right? You speak of your life as becoming technology. Do you actually think that we, as mortal humans, are actually missing out? Because some might say you're enhancing human life. Do you actually think we're not quite experiencing the whole thing? Are we missing something? No, each person is, is its own world. I mean. In my case, I get bored very easily. Maybe other people don't, but having the same senses for the rest of my life would be, uh, for me, a very boring experience. But I guess for other people, it, it won't. And, it, and that's why many people won't do this. But uh, there's a point when all our senses become a repetition. And that's what I felt when I was 18, 19. I felt, OK, I'm, I'm sensing the same over and over. That's why many people start taking drugs, because then you can experience things a bit differently. Or uh, you can actually then specifically also design uh, senses, which is uh, basically, I think, it's experiencing life again, because uh, there's different ways of exploring the Earth. 
or discovering the Earth before we would discover Earth by going to places that we've never been or no one has ever been. But now we can discover Earth by adding new senses. If you add ultraviolet, this uh, space becomes completely different. And, and your daily routine becomes completely different, completely new. It's still the same reality, but it's uh, adding a new sense. So I don't call this virtual reality, and I don't call it augmented reality. I call it real reality, because it's simply, it's RR, not VR or AR. It's RR, because it's simply sensing reality that exists, but that our body cannot sense. And to make sure that this is not AI, this is AS. Uh, it's not artificial intelligence, it's an artificial sense. And it's very different. If the antenna was telling me the names of colors, it would be AI my brain wouldn't have to really work, but it's AS. My brain has to create the knowledge. And that's what I think is beautiful about adding new senses, that your brain needs to uh, accept or add this new input and create the knowledge it's in its own. So it's, uh, it's much more, it creates a much more unique experience. We talk a lot about trusting our senses, right? Like a gut feeling or our intuition. Would you say that you trust your your antenna sense? Is that how you would call the, the um, your sense through the antenna? Would you yeah. trust it more than other senses? Do you go to that first? Can you even distinguish at this point? Yeah, I trust it. Uh, I trust it, yes. But I, I'm, I, I also understand that each of us are, are sensing things in a different way. We all have the same organs, but perception is unique to each person. We cannot really compare if we are seeing or hearing the same things. It's impossible for us to compare our perception. Uh, and I guess each person accepts their own perception as as being true and real, and in the same way I accept this as being true and real, but I also accept the fact that you are sensing things differently. Even if we have the same eye sensory organs, we will sense things differently, perceive things differently, because we have all have unique brains and different ways of processing all this, so... Uh, but the combination of senses is, I guess, I, is your reality. Yeah, it makes yeah, I, I accept subjectivity this, this into sense, a whole new thing. Yeah, I, I, I accept it as, any of my organic senses, right, yes. right, the same level, yes. So before we get into the questions, one more thing. I saw you had a whole lot of pictures of uh, sensing male faces. Can I ask you to have a look yes. at mine and let the audience know just how? So you have E, between E and F, very high-pitched lips, very. like Robert De Niro, actually. Oh. <laughs> Robert De Niro has very well, high-pitched sound. Thank you very much. Your hair is F sharp, uh, F sharp, uh, profound F sharp your eyes as well, F sharp. So you have different shades of F sharp and E. So low frequencies combined with a very high pitch note of lips. Interesting, okay. I'm getting to know myself in a whole other way. Now I'll pass it over to the audience. So you guys are upvoting and downvoting all of these questions, very nice. So we'll start with Mariana. Is it difficult to perform regular activities such as showering or sleeping? <laughs> Uh, I obviously shower, otherwise I would smell a lot. So I, I, it's waterproof. Uh, sleeping is fine. I just sleep sideways. It doesn't bother me. Actually, the height at the beginning bothered me because my bed suddenly became a bit smaller because I am taller now. So it, it does sometimes touch the... the um, and the last one, it's uh, actually the more senses you have, the more chances you have to experience things uh, a bit uh, more. So I guess it's uh, the more senses, the better. <laughs> hmm. uh, we're really getting some pro tips here today, really. Um, Laurence is asking, can you focus your color vision or do you hear everything at once? So I had the, 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 the choice of deciding how I wanted to sense color, so I decided I wouldn't want to use an eye tracker, so I didn't want to have something connected to my sight. I didn't want color to be connected to sight, so I didn't add an eye tracker. Uh, then I had the chance of choosing if I wanted stereo vision, like having half and half or four or eight. I didn't want this either. I wanted just the dominant color. I wanted to feel the dominant color in front of me. So that's how it works. It's just giving me, not the average, but the dominant color in front of me. So if I want to sense the dominant color, I get close. So that's why I get close to face. It's like, Similar to smell, if you wanna, if you go in a room, you smell the general smell, then you can get closer to smelling different things. It's a bit more similar than 
than eyes, I guess. So you mentioned the uh, possibility to sort of send pictures with five of your um, closest people, right, on, on all the different continents. Does it ever happen that somebody sends you something like, you know, a, a selfie of themselves um, or anything really that you did not ask for? Is it possible yeah, yeah, they... to send you something where you're sort of surprised by it coming in? Well, it's five people that I know a lot, so right. sometimes I guess who it is. And also, if they start sending lots of colors, uh, sometimes I know that they're trying to annoy me sometimes. Also, it, in all this time, I've been hacked once, so none of them had, uh, none of them were, was sending pictures. I was wondering who it was, and then we realized that someone had hacked the system and was sending me colors, sending colors to my head uh, without permission. So I was physically hacked once. But it was a, a great experience. I really liked it. It wasn't a bad experience to be physically... It was a surprise that someone was able to do that. It was because I used public internet at, at a specific time, and I wasn't using my own internet system, so I, I was using public, and someone knew that I was using that system and just sent some images in my head. Wow. Are you scared of that kind of a security breach, though? So we're talking pictures now, right? What if what yeah, if someone ever manages to send you something else right into your brain? Well, that's one of the cyborg rights we are... Uh, there's no rights defending this. So I think we should all have the right to decide who has the right to enter your mind. Uh, now there's no uh, laws regulating this. So you as a, someone that has a, a, a sense connected to the Internet should be entitled to decide if you allow this person or this company to access your head. And that's something that is still not regulated. So, yes, I think that's one of the main things that should be regulated, I guess. Wow. So, Maximilian is up, downvoted, and it's gone. The Meccan is now asking, how do you charge it? So, now I have to charge it. And most of the uh, implants we, we showed are need to be charged through coil, external coil. But the aim is to use blood circulation. So, in my case, it, it would be with a small turbine in the blood vessel so that it continuously, continuously charges the, the implant. The aim is not to use external energy, not to even use solar energy. The aim is to use body energy. And the best option would be blood, because blood circulation is constantly uh, moving. So. Have, having small turbines in the blood vessels is the best way of continuously charging these new organs. Does that mean if you if you exercise or can you do something to sort of charge it faster, or so does that just it, completely happen biologically at this point? So if you want the like, if you use kinetic energy to charge it, then yes. If you go to the gym, then this would charge it better. But if you use blood circulation, you don't really need to do anything. Blood goes. Anyway, speed, you so you can, it goes, it charges non-stop, right. basically. Also, this is the last organ that will die. I mean, whenever I die, the antenna will still be on. So that's uh, also, it will live longer than my organic part. So if I'm buried, people will still be able to send colors to my head while I'm dead, basically. <laughs> but actually, this is going to be, but no, because I'm, I'm putting this antenna as a, I'm an uh, organ donor, so this is also a donor. So anyone that wants to have the antenna might have the antenna implanted. Wow. So in theory, I want this antenna to continue alive when I'm dead so that someone else will have this organ and will be continually. It's an artwork that then will be able to be experienced by someone else. Can you save, experience, save colors, I guess? Can you save your life experience of colors into the antenna and then pass it on? No, I use the brain to, 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 to save. save, yes. I, this, this has no system of, of recording, there's no intelligence, it's just a sensor sending the vibrations in the brain and then the brain reacts in its own way. So this same antenna and different heads would have different reactions because it's uh, the same way that eyes in different heads have different reactions. Has that changed your your perception of your own sort of identity, right? We think of ourselves as sort of, you know, our biological makeup and our sort of cognitive makeup, and then you, you've had this, you know, addition to it. Did, did that have a sort of emotional change for you? And now you're yeah, saying my that sense you can of identity. live on. Yeah, my sense of identity has changed. I, the definition of human no longer defines me uh, completely, because there's no antenna in the definition of human, there's no infrared and ultraviolet perception in the definition of human, so I feel uncomfortable because uh, this word no longer defines me completely. So I feel much more comfortable defining myself as a transspecies because uh, it's adding senses and organs that are not traditionally human. Um, so yes, transspecies is a, is a, an, in, a type of transspecies is a cyborg, the, uh, the use of cybernetics to add these new senses and new organs. So I guess in the same way that transgender surgeries were not accepted uh, many years ago and still are not accepted in many countries, now 
transspecies searches are not accepted, but I'm, I'm sure they will be accepted by bioethical committees soon, and people who want to become transspecies will go to specific countries in the same way that transgender people went to specific countries back in the 60s to have surgery done legally. Wow. Let's turn it back to the audience. So Lisa is uh, asking, do you ever crave for silence? Silence is uh, the absence of color. So if I have no color, then it's silence. And this happens a lot. If I turn up, switch off the lights and there's no infrared and no one is sending colors to my head. But silence is impossible. As John Cage uh, said, it's impossible to find silence. Even if you go to a silent room and you try to find silence, you will hear your blood, you will hear something. There's always sound. Silence is, uh, imagine, uh, something that we can only imagine. But no, there's no silence. And I, if I want to things to be a bit quieter, then I just have spaces without color. My bedroom has no color, for example. Huh. What, is, what does this room feel like? What is the meat convention? Someone's actually also asking Very C-sharp. So shades of C-sharp, C-C-sharp, shades of blue, lots of uh, shades of blue and nice high pitch, keeps you alert. Okay, all yes. right. Stay alert. Andreas is asking, how far can we take self-enhancement without alienating ourselves from human nature? Are there any borders we shouldn't overstep, do you think? I think each person should find their own limits. I find my own limits. Uh, someone else will find their own limits. But I think it's not taking us away from uh, nature. It might be taking us away from being human. But why are we so afraid about becoming less human? We can become something uh, a bit more uh, transspecies. I mean, by not becoming human, you're not becoming worse. You might be, a, a dog is not human, and I, uh, they, not all of them are bad. I mean, other species, being another species is not bad. I think we should stop thinking that we are in this bubble called human. We've not always been human. We, life started like in the ocean, then we, we escaped from the ocean, then we became some kind of species living on the earth, then we lived on the trees, now we uh, define ourselves as human. But now we are merging with technology and we are becoming a new species, which will eventually be able to survive in space, which is our ultimate aim. How can we become the first species that can actually survive in space? If we want to survive in space, we need to change ourselves. We can't even survive on Earth. Our species has been changing our planet for thousands of years. We've been changing the environment in order to survive. We should stop that. We should change ourselves in order to survive. Instead of using artificial light, we should have night vision. It's, it's uh, weird that we are lighting up half of the planet uh, when it's dark, when instead we should focus on creating night vision so that we don't need to use all this artificial light in order to see. Uh, also regulate our own temperature, not uh, use air conditioning when it's hot and use heaters when it's cold. We should be able to regulate our own temperature. This will be much better for Earth and for other species. Do you see... Uh, <laughs> Some fans. You, you point out a few areas where it seems incredibly convenient and would certainly enhance, if not enrich, the, the human experience. Do you see any sort of dangers or risks of maybe people being in any kind of situation forced to um, have something implanted, forced to sense something? Is there such a thing as being forced to sense something that we haven't consented to? That's one of the rights as well. No one should force anyone to add new senses or new organs. We should all be free to decide if we want or we don't want to add new senses. That's one of the rights we also think is necessary to... I mean, we all have the right not to do it. And, and that's uh, something that I'm, I'm sure... Some people say that we will all become savage. No, I'm sure people will decide whether or not they want. And also, it's not about money. It's about willing to do it or not. Look at the most rich, the rich per people are not doing this. It's mm -hmm. the poorest. Uh, people like myself and many people who have uh, no uh, means of doing it are actually the ones that are trying to merge with technology in order to add new senses. You don't need much money to, to, to do this. It's senses that already exist, but we've been giving all these senses to machines for the last decades. We're just applying these existing senses to the body, and it's not expensive to become a cyborg. It's uh, just people who want to do it can do it with very simple uh, sensors, basically. Well, two practical questions, because I'm uh, hearing that we don't have much time left. First of all, how do you wash your hair with the antenna, and how do you pass airport security? I wash my hair like anyone else it's just uh it's waterproof so i can it can get wet it, i can even go on a sw the swimming pool i'm not sure how deep i can go so i don't go too deep because i don't want it to get bro broke but it's like a phone that i like a uh, many um, watches Watch are it can get uh, wet airport security is always a show usually because it's uh i go one hour ahead because 
it creates situations. So I usually give a lot of explanations to the people at the airport. The secu- they, I usually give a talk. My first talk is always at the airport, uh, trying to explain what all this is. And then they either take me aside. In some cases in Vienna, they called the doctor of the airport to check if I was mentally stable to board the plane. So in some cases, they, 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 they worry. Wow. Well, thank you for a very mentally stable performance here. And thank you for a life-enhancing and sense-enriching experience to us. Thank you so much, Neil Harvest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so everyone who would like to apply for the organ donation of Neil Harperson over here, no. Um, please stick in the room if you want to hear Hartmut Esslinger and Moira Gunn to talk about the importance of design in all kinds of areas. It's going to be very interesting in about 10 minutes. Stick around, have a drink, race back here. Thank you very much.